You know, many of the times we teach our children the Word of God. It was the Ten Commandments that brought me to Christ. You know, my, I think I was five years old. My dad took me for a walk and he said, today is the Sabbath. And he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And later on, I came, when I learned to read, I realised that was read in um, Exodus and in Deuteronomy. And um, very powerful because what is it that brings us to Christ and what is it that then reflects the deep Christology of our total transformation. And um, we read in Genesis where Abraham kept all of God's laws and commandments and judges and statutes. And we think, well, what ones? It's only until we come to the Sinai that you recognise God's thunders, his word from Sinai, and people say, oh, it's too loud. Moses, you speak to on behalf of God. And so today I'm going to talk about the Ten Commandments. And um, I know that the law, the commandments, have brought me to Christ in a very powerful and personal way. And I don't have the scriptures on the screen, so I encourage you now to turn to Luke chapter 18. There was a young man, and he was a ruler, and he asked a question. Because sometimes you think, what question? If you could talk to Jesus face to face and have an audience, what would you ask him? He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I think that's the question of all questions. What am I going? What do I have to do to live forever? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. In verse 20 of Luke 18, you know the commandments. And so Jesus lists five commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honour your father and mother. I'll tell you why Jesus listed five commandments and not the full ten there. We'll come to that shortly. And this man said to him, all these I've kept from my youth. And I'm in that category. I'm grateful, like Rebecca and many others, um, to have grown up as a part of the body of Christ. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one, still, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard these things, he couldn't do it because he was extremely rich. And that's part of the story. But the question that I want to focus on is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus po pointed him to the royal moral law. Remember the Ten Commandments? was special from all the other laws and judgments and statutes that were given to ancient Israel. The Ten Commandments were stored in the Ark of the Covenant under the mercy seat, symbolising the very throne of God. And so they were special. And today we are a people who live by the commandments of God and the testimony and faith of Jesus, to take these words out of Revelation. So I'm going to turn to Exodus 20. We're going to spend a bit of time in Exodus 20 this morning to briefly look at the commandments and then talk about what Jesus, how Jesus illuminates them for, the, for proper response in Christ. Exodus 20 and verse 2, the Lord says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am your deliverer. I am your protector. Number one, the first commandment is you shall have no gods before me. God establishes himself at the very pinnacle of relationship, of law, of morality, of creation, of redemption. Then number two, he breaks it down to a little bit further because people had come out of idolatry. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is on the earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. Then he says, you know, you can make a statue or you can make something that has a physical representation of a heavenly being or something on earth. Verse 5 in Exodus 20, you shall not bow down them or serve them. And for our days, what do people worship? They worship money, they worship status, they worship power, they worship movie heroes and they worship those on the sporting field. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. Have you ever thought of God jealous? His next commandment, he says, and then we go down to verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord God your va in vain. They're very interesting, names are very powerful. In a few cases, God changed the names of people and... Um, Names are very powerful. So God says, don't take my name in vain. Don't, you know, there's a lot of cuss words in society. I remember growing up working in a workplace and my dad said, well, John, that, that's taking God's name in vain. And I thought, oh, I didn't know that, you know. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Jehovah. You know, holy, in fact, we don't even know how to pronounce it because the ancient Hebrews took the, the vowels out and names are very, very important. And the fourth commandment is the one that I first learned as a boy is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we are reminded of through the Sabbath 
that God takes us, the, 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 the signature of creation, God created the earth, he reveals in six days and rested on the seventh day. It points us to our ultimate spiritual rest in Christ. Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was made for man. You and I are very familiar with that. Six days shall you labour and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So God was teaching those ancient Israelites coming out of slavery the difference between the, the sanctified and the secular. That belongs to the work and your own time and that time that we devote to God in prayer and meditation and fellowship and reading of the scripture. On the Sabbath you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or even the sojourner who's in your gates. So you may have a stranger from a different country, he's not irreligious. You say, sorry mate, we're not working today. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea and all is in them. So God reveals himself as a creator over six days and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And that has never been revoked all through human history. The seventh day, Saturday Sabbath stands unique. And so the first four commandments are about the love of God. Which is the greatest commandment, somebody asked Jesus. And Jesus said, love your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And what's the second one? Love your neighbour as yourself. In all the law and the prophets are summed up in the love of God and love of neighbour. So then we turn down to the next five commandments that talk about love of each other. Number first commandment or the fifth commandment, honour your father and mother that your days may be long in the land which God has given you. So this is the first commandment with promise. Honour your father and mother. If you can't honour your father and mother, how can you honour the transcendent God that you don't see? It doesn't say love your father and mother. Families are designed for love, but sometimes parents bring into the equation their brokenness, their suffering, their trauma. I've, you know, I've lived in a prosperous nation for 65 years, but my dad came through World War II as a boy between the ages of 8 and 15. My grandfather came through two world wars and died at 65. So you don't know what you inherit through the world in which we live. So you could say, well, I'm a product of my generation. I'm not very happy about it. God says, honour your father and mother. And that's very powerful. It's a commandment with a promise. Then the next commandment, in verse 13 of Exodus 20, you shall not murder. Human life is special, sanctified, holy. You shall not commit adultery. In other words, marital faithfulness, exclusive monogamous, to the exclusion of all others for a lifetime. That's the biblical model. You shall not steal. Scripture talks about you know, what it is for a thief to, to stop stealing and starting to be generous. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. So these five speak again about relationship. And, and the, 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 the tenth commandment is outside of the, 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 the four to God, the five to humanity, the number of tenth commandment deals with what happens in our minds and in our hearts. You shall not covet. And it very happens, what happens as a precursor to sin happens in our hearts and minds. Satan, the devil who was Lucifer, desired to extraordinarily covet the throne of God. And we have the very first case of deception and and treason and coveting, where it became an inordinate desire. And God says, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife. That's covered in, you shall not commit adultery. But what happens in your heart and your mind that nobody sees? Or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything is at your neighbour's, his sports car, his lovely house, his big business empire. Are you envious? Are you covetous? God says no. So, we have those ten commandments, four of the love of God, five of the recognition of living together, loving our neighbour, and number ten, what's happening in our hearts and minds. Because before I kill somebody or steal from them or, or commit a sexual adultery, I'm coveting whatever it might be. So then Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, talks about the intent of the law of God. Verse 21, he says, You have heard that it was said of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. So you could sort of think, Well, I can still, you know, um, harbour enmity or anger against someone. I haven't murdered them, but I just won't talk to them anymore. And if he's hungry, 
He can starve if he likes, in telling you. But then again, he says, if anyone's, you know, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, pray for those who malign you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. But Jesus says, you shall not murder. But I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Ouch. So the idea is, again, what's happening in your heart? And what's happening in how you treat your brother? You know, so then he talks about relationships. Verse 23, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, so you're ready to go to church and you're saying, oh, that's unresolved relationship. Pick up the phone, go and have a coffee with your brother. Leave your gift there before the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And so there are measures to, rather than allow the, the spirit of Cain to ferment, the spirit of Abel that suffered at the hands of Cain. Cain was angry. He murdered his brother. Brothers and sisters, that's the, the split down society between light and dark, good and evil, wheat and tares, the devil on one side and the Lord on the other. And Cain chose that pernicious path and he wasn't reconciled to his brother. He wasn't his brother's keeper. And so for you and I, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all people to myself. There's one church of God, one body of Christ, and their relationships are precious. You know, the, from, from Timothy and Titus and from Peter's writing, the qualifications for pastoral care is family relationships, faithfulness in marriage, and your children in order. And, um, and the, we are to be reconciled in our families, and our families constitute the church of God. Very, very powerful. Jesus talks about this idea of murder connected with what happens in our heads and our hearts. And he does that well on the sexual level as well in Matthew 5, verse 27. He said, you've heard of that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Anything outside of marriage is adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And is God going to allow the lustful glance of anybody to enter the kingdom of God? Absolutely not, unless it's repented of. Remember Job says in his suffering, now, he was in a difficult situation. He was suffering. His wife was not on his side. In fact, she was advocating the devil's line, curse God and die. And he said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look at the young virgins to desire after them. He was an older man and he said, I'm not even going to look and I'm not going to desire. That's how righteous I've been, God, and I'm telling you, God, I've never cast a, a, a sideways glance. And that Jesus says, the sideways glance is the path to adultery. If your right eye causes you to sin, says Jesus, tear it out and throw it away. That's pretty strong language. Now, he's not asking you to physically maim yourself. He's asking you, as drastic as it takes, to stop the wandering eye. And that applies for men. You have cougar women in this age. I didn't know much about them, but they do exist. You know, the power of sexual, you know, the sexual desire is as, uh, almost as powerful as thirst if you've been fasting or as food if you're hungry. So God gave us something that's very beautiful and very powerful. And it's probably the most abused utility in this age, I hate to say. And um, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, so you've looked with your eye and now like David... He goes and asks Bathsheba, hello, do you want to come inside my house for the day? I'm paraphrasing. If your right hand causes you to thin, sin, so you go to the doorknob and open a door in your life that you should never open, cut your hand off, says Jesus, and throw it away. You've got to be drastic with it. You know, with Cain, the Lord came up to Jesus and says, Cain, sin is crouching at the door, but you must overcome it. You must, must overcome it. This wasn't with sexuality, this was to do with his hatred and anger for his brother. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. In other words, Jesus is saying, this is drastic, deal with it. It's very powerful. I want to talk about the idea of covet. Because Apostle Paul makes the idea that he, would, he upholds the law. When you read Paul and he talks about the law, you read, sometimes he uses the word law to refer to the Jewish law of oral tradition. And sometimes he refers to the commandments of God. But he says in Romans 7 verse 7, and this is very powerful because he chooses not of the four 
of the Ten Commandments, not of the existing five of human relationships. He talks about what happens in the heart and what happens in the mind. Romans 7, 7, What then shall we say? That the law is sin by no means? Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So out of the Ten Commandments, Paul talks to one that really speaks to our personal stewardship of what happens in our hearts and minds. And he chose covet out of all the commandments. Now, I want to define covet. I went to the Merriam Wisdom, Merriam Webster Dictionary, and it says to desire what belongs to another inordinately or culpably, like the king's brother coveted the throne. <laughs> We've seen that happen in history. In other words, to feel an inordinate desire for what belongs to another. That's what the dead Lucifer did. I will be up and I'll send the Most High. I'll be like the Most High. Not for him. And so the Hebrew word for covet can also be translated lust. So it reaches into that. And the book of Proverbs warns against coveting in the form of lust. I'm going to paraphrase from, the, from, from, from Proverbs. The, the, the author says, Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her capture you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress preys upon your very life. So you can see something that's beautiful, lovely, but it's not yours. And if you allow it to ferment, Jesus says in the Revelation, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to him who overcomes, to him who conquers. And that's why you and I are living in a society where the gates of hell are ever present. The darkness and brokenness of a sinful world under the guise and the, the sovereignty of the devil. And what Jesus did was to break the power of the devil, to break the curse of the death, break the curse of sin, and invite us, redeemed humanity, as children of God to live forever. And, um, you know, coveting pulls the heart down into the pit of self-seeking, and the muck and mire of envy, slander, adultery, pride, dishonour, murder, thievery and idolatry. It's been rightly said that when we break any of the first nine commandments, we also break the tenth commandment. So coveting is very significant. You know, if you think about human nature, coveting is really a part of human nature. I've been blessed with six children and ten grandchildren. And even as babies, they will go, or children, grab something of the other child. That's your toy? It's going to become my time. And, I, and grab it. Very seldom will you say, oh, look, I've got this toy. Do you want to play with it? So the idea that how are we going to overcome poverty? How do you overcome this inordinate desire? Well, there's a psalm that says, and I should have had the scripture here, where David says, I want to be in the temple and ob observe the beauty of the Lord and be immersed in, he in the heavenly spectrum. The book of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So the antidote to coveting, number one, is to look to Christ. So that when you see something beautiful, like a beautiful flower rose in somebody's garden, or a or a handsome man, Joseph in Pharaoh in, in Egypt was very handsome. And Potiphar's wife coveted him so desperately. It's a horrible story. And you and I, to break human nature, the only way we can do is to immerse ourselves in the beauty of the Lord, in the power of his love for us through the death and sacrifice, through his risen glory, and behold the word of God who spoke everything into existence. That God designed the human being in his image and likeness. He designed male and female. He designed the drawer of sexuality. He designed it all. So I would rather look at the designer than I would at his creation. Some people worship the creation. Let us worship our saviour. The second thing is to live in contentment. Be content where you are. Paul said, I, I've learned contentment and he's got chains in his wrists as he's writing to those in Philippi from a prison in Rome. I'm not sure I'd really be content like that. I'd be crying out, you know. And the th third item is be thankful for what you have. In other words, rejoice in thankfulness. So you see, the Ten Commandments are a starting point and the Ten Commandments bring us to be transformed into the mind of Christ to look to Christ, to live in contentment and to rejoice 
in thankfulness. And I want to wrap our thoughts up today because the law is designed to bring us to Christ. So you could see a person keeping Sabbath. Two people. One person keeps Sabbath in obedience to the law so he can merit salvation. Another person recognises his saviour, Jesus, surrenders to Jesus and keeps the Sabbath as a response to the saving grace that Jesus extends to all the world. So both of them, one is based on legal legalism and the other one is based on grace. And Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not just for Hebrews. The Sabbath was made for man and it finds itself as the fourth commandment. And it's a commandment that's never been revoked. In Revelation 12, 17, we see at the end time the dragon making war with the remnant of her seed, the body of Christ, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. You cannot just keep the commandments of God and put Jesus out of the equation. Many Torah believers feel they can because they deny the Messiah. Neither can you take Jesus and forget his commandments. Jesus says on the last day, many will come to you, him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty, mighty works? And he'll say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. Paul says the law is holy, just and good, but the law can't save me. The Ten Commandments is beautiful, is holy, is true, is good, is designed by God. But the Ten Commandments can't save me because do you know what they do? They condemn me because all have sinned and fallen short of God. And yet the Ten Commandments are a recipe for love of God and love of each other that lead us to Christ and we have a fulfilling life from that. John 14, 15, Jesus says two things. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice the love comes first and then the commandments follow. You could say keep my commandments and then love me. But Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And John 14, verse 15, uh, 21, just a few verses on. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So you can see the inverse is true as well. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You know, when Jesus says, I will love you, I will come to you, I will have fellowship with you. We will eat together. That's very powerful and very, very encouraging. This is divine fellowship. And so what we experience as a result of the Ten Commandments is, and I grew up on the Ten Commandments. I'm so grateful for that. As a young man, it guided my heart from falling into pitfalls. I knew that I was not to look at pornography. And one of the biggest banes of all of society is the addiction to pornography that undermines the sanctity and holiness of marriage and leads to all kinds of things. Brothers and sisters, we give God thanks for this giveaway line in Abraham kept all God's laws and commandments and judgments and statutes. We have the law of God thundered from Mount Sinai. We have the Ten Commandments written by his finger in tablets of stone. We have the personified Christ, the Word of God, speaking to us and we have his law written into our hearts. So you and I, in a love response to the saving grace extended to us, reflect love of God and love for each other. And today on the on International Federation, the church around the world, we celebrate this reality together, that we are the people who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus.